You're listening to a message preached from the pulpit of the Bible Baptist Church, St. Thomas, Ontario. Will you stand with me? Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm kind of nervous in front of people. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, for the last number of years, uh, of course, I worked for Joe Preston for a number of years, and now... We're sorry. We're sorry. About yeah. That. <laughs> and now as the member of parliament, I can tell you that this man is, is strength. The work that we do as members of parliament can be really, really difficult. But knowing that you have somebody and knowing that he has a church behind him that sits there and gives you the strength. And I watched him do that. I watched you do that for Joe. I watched you do that for me. Really emotional today, so don't mind me. But Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you know, today I sent my son off at 10 after 10 to go back to Gagetown where he is serving in the army. Mm. And I said to Mike, he said, well, we better get going. We're going to be late. I said, if anyone understands family, it's this man. And to your family, for all of their dedication to this church and to the people of St. Thomas and Elgin County, and to you especially, I will never forget our great time in an elevator as Captain Canada rode up with <laughs> rode up with Joe and I as we're going to the parliamentary restaurant, and, and in walks Justin Trudeau. Yes. And... Uh, <laughs> And we're not allowed to have guns in this country. <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is what it says. <laughs> it says it this is a man who's all about Canada. This is a man that's all about family. This is a man that's all about community. And you have served us so well for these last 30 years. I, too, am sorry that I haven't been here for 30 years because I can tell you that you make me laugh every time I see you <laughs> and that you are an honor to have as a friend. We wish you all the best, and on behalf of all the people of Elgin, Middlesex, London, as well as all the people of Canada, thanks for making Canada a greater place. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I love you. I appreciate you. Karen was a, a great help and instrumental in me being able to meet Joe and spend some time with Joe. She did a great job running his office and has done a great job as our member of parliament. I will let you know that she represents her constituents. She knows her constituents. And I want to say today, Mike, thank you for your contribution. It's not easy for uh, a man to have a wife who goes off every week to Ottawa to serve in that capacity. And you've done well with that. And I've prayed for you many times about that. Every time I see a post, I stop and just ask the Lord to help you with that. And uh, we appreciate not only your, your service, but your friendship. It has meant a great deal to both Ruthie and I. And no matter where we are, if we're at the park for a celebration or we're, you know, at a fair for a celebration, always takes time. And we appreciate that so very much. God bless you. I love you. And I appreciate both of you and your family. We'll, we'll continue to uh, pray that uh, in this next election, we make a difference. Amen. We make a difference. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much. And uh, we also have with us, with us our member of Pro Provincial Parliament, Mr. Jeff Urich. And uh, we were a little concerned that he wouldn't be able to make it today. He was on family holidays. And uh, so we're very thankful that he was able to come and meet, meet with us here today. We're honored to have him as well. Amen. No kiss necessary. Yeah. <laughs> The problem with following Karen, I always come across as the uncaring one. <laughs> it's been eight years uh, since I first uh, met Pastor Stone, and I remember I was just uh, newly elected, and he called me to come in to see him. And usually when a pastor calls you to come in to see him, it's not usually good news, so I was, <laughs> was fearing it, so I went out to... Uh, the, the, yeah, the precious seed, very impression seed building, and uh, he invited me up to his office, and I saw nothing but Tim Hortons, and I thought, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> but uh, it was a good meeting. It, uh, he, he, he taught me what, what goes on there and what goes on in this community, this church, and uh, asked for some help, and then he said a prayer for me. It was great. And then I started getting the odd Facebook saying a prayer for me. Um, so I, uh, I did what I could for him, and uh, I do what I do can for anybody in this uh, constituency. So I just, uh, you know, I can echo what Karen's words are gonna say. I'm not gonna start tearing up Karen. Um, I could, I could, because he does make, makes a big difference. I wanna thank this uh, church. I wanna thank the people here. I wanna thank the pastor. Because whether you know it or not, you've been a good crutch for me. My mom had uh, health issues and you prayed for Yes, we did. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, we did. Thank you. You got me, Karen. <laughs> <laughs> humor, humor helps all. 
Anyways, I just want to say thanks to each and everyone. I want to thank the pastor, thank his family for what you've given to this community. And whether you know it or not, you do, you do touch lives and you make differences. So on behalf of the province of Ontario, I can say that now because I'm a minister of the province of Ontario. Um, we want to thank you on behalf of what you do for your constituency, your 30 years of ministry at the Bible Baptist Church. And uh, uh, there's a little gift certificate of Tim Hortons, of course, in here. <laughs> Not paid for by the province or any provincial dollars. <laughs> but we wish you all the best. We wish everyone here in the best and new path. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, you can keep this. <laughs> I'll keep this. <laughs> Jeff Yurk is now a minister. And I said, how's that minister thing working out for you? He goes, I don't know how you do it. <laughs> You're doing a great job as our minister of transportation. And uh, I do pray for you often and all of our politicians. And it does make a difference. And our church has prayed for your family and the loss of your mom. Uh, he came out to see me at Bearing Precious Seed when we were trying to get the taxation off of that building. And I said, Jeff, I said, uh, I've spoken to some, t- some people. And I said, uh, the only way that we can become tax free is if we get a bill passed in uh, Queens Park. I said, would you be willing to help us with that? And uh, Tom Johnson, who's here today, was a integral part of that as well. And uh, he said, yeah, I'll do that for you. I see what you're doing. I think it's a good thing. And in that day, I said, Jeff, I said, you've been so kind. I said, is there anything I can pray about? And he stopped. He said, my, my mom's not well. Would you pray for my mom? And I said, I certainly will. And so we prayed together that day, bearing precious seed. I'll never forget that day. I'll never forget that day. I felt like I was finally able to do something for a politician that other people maybe wouldn't be able to do. And um, his mom recovered uh, from that time. And then I got a call just a few months ago, and he said, could you pray again? My mom's not well again. And the Lord saw fit to take her. And uh, I was privileged to be able to go and pay respects on behalf of our church and to be able to meet some of his other family. And uh, I do, I, I love and appreciate you, and thank you so much. He's recognized many things in our church and uh, will always be a great uh, treasure to have those things. Thank you again so very much. God bless you. Last but not least, we have our mayor and a longtime friend of our church, Mayor Joe Preston. And um, it's exciting to have him here. He's newly elected, and we're excited to have him. He and Pastor go back, I think, farther than anybody else. And so it's exciting to have him here. I'm going to make it three for three. (laughs) (laughs) Is she that smile? You don't see it all. <laughs> oh. I was just mentioning, when you see him without it, then there's something important to going to be said to you. Um, first of all, I want to thank the church. I, I, we feel it. We truly do. This, this church and uh, the other churches in our jurisdictions pray for politicians a lot. Many of us need more prayer than others, but, but we do feel it, and I thank you for that. That smile, that man. Um, I, I can just, I'm going to reminisce a couple of times. One is watching him in his Captain Canada jacket walk up Parliament Hill. And it was amazing, and people pointed. <laughs> and I knew him. Why did you walk away? <laughs> And then another time we had uh, Prime Minister Harper here um, almost secretly to the radio show and I invited uh, Pastor Stone to come meet him. He wore his Captain Canada jacket. (laughs) And I'm not certain the RCMP were really sure about letting this guy in. But, but, But they did. And my other greatest memory of, of Pastor Stone is in my office as the Member of Parliament. I was, um, I was the Member of Parliament. And it was a great job, but there was a bit of emptiness in my life. And Pastor Stone helped me find Jesus Christ. Amen. Yep, three for three. <laughs> It's made a big difference in my life, but doesn't come close to the difference that Pastor Stone and this group has done for our city of St. Thomas. 
we are a far better place because this man's been here for 30 years. There is no doubt in my mind we will continue to be a better place because he's not really leaving. Right. Right? Get we get a two for one deal. Yeah. Right? So we'll continue to watch for that. But I, I, I wanted to stand here today and earnestly say on behalf of the city of St. Thomas, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Stone. That was one of the greatest days of my life. Not when I met the prime minister, when he met Jesus. That's why I've pastored here for 30 years. So that people could know Jesus Christ. Some of you still don't. And before I leave here today, I would love to introduce you to my savior so that you could have that same kind of testimony. There's something missing in your life and you know it. A job, money, status does not fulfill. Only Jesus Christ can do that. Please know him today. Let me just say, in my last capacity as a pastor in this church, Mr. Mayor, this church in no way wants marijuana to be sold in this city. Amen. And all the voting members of the church said, Amen. nobody's opposing that. We don't want it in our city. You if you haven't received the email yet, need to get hold of our city hall. There's a vote coming up. Is it the 14th or 15th? 14th, I believe it is. They'll be discussing it at city council, uh, whether or not we want marijuana legally sold in our city. If the city votes it down, that's great. It won't happen. If they vote it in, they can never remove that. You need to take action. We have sent out an email. Um, we will get you that information. You need to contact Mr. Wendell Graves at City Hall. Send him an email. Give him your name, your address, your phone number. Let him know. I am against the sale of marijuana in this city. We don't want it grown here. We don't want it sold here. We can't stop some of that stuff. But it's not for the betterment of our city. We've seen that. We've got people in this auditorium today that will tell you that their children have been lost and some have perished because of drugs in their lives. We don't need that here. We need more of this here. This is what we need. And we need people to know the gospel of Jesus Christ. Joe, thank you for being a great friend. Thank you for your openness. I'll never forget the day I sat in your office. He called me. Somebody had sent him a CD. And he said, I need to talk to you. And I went over and I sat down. And with tears in his eyes, falling down his face, he called on the Lord Jesus Christ to save him. I'll never forget that as long as I live. And then the day that he called and he said, what are you doing on Friday? And I said, I'm running the country. He said, no, but you're going to meet the man who does. And one of the greatest uh, privileges I've had was it, to be able to meet uh, one of our greatest prime ministers, Prime Minister Stephen Harper. And if you still have contact information, I'm going to call him and beg him in the future to come back. Uh, we could use him. And in our upcoming election, please do your part and vote. Do your part and vote. Um, as God lays on your heart. Amen. Thank you, politicians. You sometimes get a very bad rap. Um, you take a lot of flack, and sometimes the only calls they get are people that are upset or people that are despondent. Would you call them from time to time and just say, hey, we appreciate you. We thank you. We're praying for you. Take them a cup of coffee once in a while. Take them a donut. Not Joe, but take the other ones a donut. <laughs> He likes trail mix better. <laughs> and I know where you can get a good deal on it. But uh, please uh, continue that on. And Pastor Yeomans, I'll tell you that these are your friends. These are people that you need to meet and greet. And um, when I first came, our mayor at that time was Janet Golding. And she was a wonderful lady. She was the iron lady. She really was. And my father-in-law gave me this advice. He said, I want to tell you one thing. He said, meet the mayor, take the mayor out for lunch and ask that mayor, where should I build a church in this city? And we did that. And Ruthie and I both uh, met with uh, Mayor Golding. We took her out to lunch at the, uh, the arms, the, uh, what was it, arms, the um, Branks, Branks Arms. We went for lunch. It was a beautiful place. And um, she said, uh, I'm telling you right now where to build a church. She said, you need to get property on Highbury Avenue. She says, it doesn't go through right now, but that's where you want to go. And sure enough, that's where we ended up. It took about 20 years to get there. But these, these folks have worked very hard to help our church in many different ways. And they've always had an open door for us. And they'll have an open door for you. And um, take them, the concerns of our church. Let them know where we're at. It's important for them to hear from us. They need to know on the issues where we stand. And a lot of times they don't. 
And that's not fair to them because they have to make a decision based on what they hear from the constituents. They need to hear from you. God bless you. Thank you. And carry that message for us. If you would, I've already sent mine in, but you do the same, every one of you. If you don't, shame on you. If it comes through, you'll have nothing to say about it. Let's do our part. All right. God bless you. Amen. And uh, one last thing we were going to have, we asked the police chief to come and uh, he was unfortunately not able to make it. And so he did send along a letter and he says, good morning, everyone. I would like to pass along my sincere regrets for not being able to be in attendance this morning to express support for a person who I connected so easily with in a short period of time. Our police service had the fortunate experience of being graced with the presence of Pastor Stone and some of the kids from your church in 2018. I strongly believe in community engagement, especially with youth, so they know we are always here to assist them. Thank you to Pastor Stone and those of you at the Bible Baptist Church who thought of this wonderful idea. That would be our Love Works program. While escorting Pastor Stone to the cell block again, oops. I mean, providing him with a tour of the police station. That's written here. We carried a conversation with ease and shared a common bond of family, community, and a desire to help people. Even though this was my first time meeting Al, I quickly realized how genuine and passionate he is about enhancing the well-being of our police officers and our community. I knew right away this was a person our members needed to meet and use as a valuable resource when times became stressful. Within a few months, Pastor Stone was riding along with our officers on the front line. The police culture can be a tough nut to break into, and I know Pastor Stone experienced this firsthand at the onset. But as I alluded to earlier, he is a genuine person who means well, and it didn't take long for our staff to realize this. One of our members summed it up when when I inquired about Pastor Stone being at the police station. He is such a nice and down-to-earth man. I couldn't agree more, and it is Pastor Stone's compassionate personality that has no doubt benefited so many of you in this church, as well as many others in the community. Pastor Stone's journey of giving back to the community after 30 years is not over as he continues on such a rewarding path to raise funds for the ministry of Bearing Precious Seed Canada. Timing is everything, and now that Pastor Stone has a little bit of free time and pending approval from his wife, of course, I look forward to Pastor Stone joining our members on their journey of community service and self-sacrifice. On behalf of the St. Thomas Police Service, thank you for, the, for decades of community service, Chris C. Harris, Chief of Police. Oh, you want to say anything about that? Yeah. Uh, I'm meeting Wednesday with the chief of police and the deputy police of chief to see about doing a co-chaplaincy with uh, Pastor Steve McCready from Faith Community Church. He's the chaplain there. And he said, I just don't have the time to commit to these police officers. And uh, I said, I do. I'm going to have that time. The Lord's freed me up to do some of those things. And I said, I would love to do that. So we're going to meet Wednesday and Lord willing, I'll be a part of the chaplain's team um, there at our police station and be able to do ride alongs with those guys more frequently and, and ladies as well. And uh, again, I've just got appreciation for those folks that are serving in our community. And uh, I just want to let them know that there's a group that really cares for them. And I'm hoping to be able to introduce to them as well the peace and the, the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Pray for that meeting on Wednesday. And then Thursday, Pastor Hall and I are going to prison. <laughs> Literally. Finally. Finally. <laughs> I'm going to escort him to the place he should have been a long time ago. We're going to Gravenhurst, and we're going to pass out about 300 John and Romans to the inmates of the federal prison in Gravenhurst. Uh, An open door to us that I believe is going to open doors to other of our federal prisons that we can take those John and Romans to those prisoners and let them know about the good news of Jesus Christ. There is a gentleman by the name of Brother Satu who is uh, part of the church over in uh, Newmarket area, and uh, he is a a guard there, and he has worked with the uh, warden, and he's worked with the chaplain there and he has got his entrance into the prison to be able to come and bring those on behalf of bearing precious seed candles that's going to be exciting and uh, at least one of us is going to come home so i'll be praying about that so it'll be awesome thank you all right one last person to say something here today is uh, pastor dan wolven and uh, they're they're friends and uh, with pastor and ruthie and um I think I've never laughed harder than watching, I think it was your 25th anniversary, is that correct? Uh, We just kind of went over next door into the fellowship hall and we just, Pastor Holland and I just kind of sat there and watched everybody and they told stories and uh, Brother Wolven would get up and tell his side of the story and it was hilarious. So Brother Wolven, would you come please? You don't have to tell any stories, you can do whatever you want, but say a few words on behalf of Pastor Stone. Do I help you up? No, because you fixed the pulpit again. (laughs) (laughs) Tell them the story. (laughs) Well, I don't want to take a lot of time, but uh, 
I uh, met a man who really loved the Lord. It was 1982, August, and uh, he was a Bible college student, and I was a, a very wise and aged uh, pastor, young pastor. I had been in the ministry for a week and a half. <laughs> and then uh, over the years, we uh, got to get to know each other a little bit more. Uh, the, whenever they came, uh, his church and Simcoe came to Cleveland about two years later, and I had asked the uh, pastor there, the assistant pastor, Brother Harry Strack, and I said, who can I get to play a joke on? He said, oh, I got a guy. <laughs> So uh, we had a banana eating contest, and uh, the person that would eat the most bananas in a minute would get $10. Now, that was 1984, so, you know, it was more than what you think now. And it was $10 U.S. US. Wow. So, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> so anyway, uh, uh, what we did, we got the contestants up there, blindfolded them all, and then, you know, uh, unblindfolded everybody else and just had one person up there trying to eat the bananas as fast as they possibly could. And uh, being a college student, he had almost no money at all for the week, and he's like, I have got to have that $10 in order to be able to get some, uh, get some meals this week. And so we enjoyed ourselves, but uh, love the Lord. And then I had a co-worker, and uh, Brother Stone came, and we worked together, uh, found a co-worker who uh, loves souls. That has been consistent in his life is that he loves to tell people about Jesus Christ. Uh, it's a passion in his life. And uh, besides all of, the, all of the comedy things that we had wound up doing, sometimes even unintentionally, um, he, he loves souls. And whenever they came here, we've, we've been here, I was trying to think with my wife, I think maybe 20, 25 different times over the years. And as we've seen this church grow and the different places where they lived and our families growing. And uh, I've seen a pastor who loves his church. I'm telling you, over all of these years, he has not ever called up and complained about something. There's been some difficult times we prayed about, but I, he never gets on the phone and complains about this person or that person. Well, except Pastor uh, Holland. But uh, <laughs> other than that, no, honestly, he, he loves this church. And he loves you people. And every person that has ever come and every person that has ever left, he has loved dearly. And uh, whenever I heard him first talk about bearing precious seed and uh, trying to reach a nation with the John and Romans. But wow, there's a man who really loves the book. So I have a friend who loves the Lord and loves to serve and loves souls, and he loves the Word of God. And it's the way of the Lord, and it's the, the way that Christianity is built upon is that now you know a young man who loves the Lord. And you're going to get to know the blessing of him as he loves souls and loves you because that's the blessed way of the things of God. So as we talk about the wonderful things that God has done through Brother Stone, what we're really saying is God is a great God. He's good all the time. And God loves this church more than any other human being ever could. Thank the Lord today. Praise the Lord for a dear friend. Praise the Lord for a church that is in good and capable hands. And most importantly, oh, I thank Jesus Christ who died for my sins. If you're going to make it in the ministry and really any facet of life. You have got to have good friends. You've got to. You've all been my friends. I've not been able to be as close to you as I've really wanted to be as a pastor. You just can't do that. But all of you have been my friends. I could call any one of you I know and say I'm in trouble and know that you'd help me. Every year I watch that movie, It's a Wonderful Life. 
Have to. Have to watch it. Because I think every year it's been a wonderful life. And I think I've never been in that place of trouble. It may come someday, but I've had times of trouble where you've called and you have emailed and you've stopped by and you've made a difference. And I want to thank you all for that. I want to recognize today Chuck and Vicki Stanberry here today. Where are they? Where are you sitting at? We're here. Chuck and Vicki traveled to be with us today, too. And Chuck was an integral part of our Bearing Precious Seed ministry. I'd be amiss not to mention that today. They're now working with the Fellowship Track League down in Lebanon, Ohio. Been there and doing a great job. They're printing millions and millions of gospel tracks sent around the world. They're going to send seven containers. How many can you fit in a container? Ten million tracks. They're going to do 70 million tracks this year that'll be sent around the world with people so they can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I want to thank them for traveling to be with us today as well. I love you guys. Vicki was our secretary for a time, and uh, Chuck worked in uh, operating our Bearing Precious Seed ministry. was a big part of our building out there, getting the building up and getting going there. And uh, I want to thank you today for being here. God bless you. Thank you for that. I love you and appreciate you. Before I preach to you out of the book of First Kings this morning, I want to say thank you again to Tom Johnson, who's here today. Tom Johnson was on city council when he heard my cry for some help to get uh, the taxation off of our building out of Bearing Precious Seed. When we first built it, they were taxing, taxing us around $13,000 a year. We went to the authorities at hand and they said, we'll cut that in half to about $7,000 a year. And I said, that's still too much. It's a ministry of our church. It's nonprofit. And Tom heard my cry, and he really did a lot of the legwork to help us get that through. And Tom, if you would just raise your hand so folks can see it. Tom's been here before. You know him. He's a great realtor in our town now. He's doing a great job. Um, and I remember the day that Tom came to my office, and Tom and I sat, and I said, Tom, there's something missing in your life. And he said, yeah, there is. And I said, you need Jesus Christ. And so he prayed and asked Jesus Christ to save him as well. And I'm so glad for that. He got done. He goes, wow, that's awesome. I said, it really is. Throughout that whole process, things would happen. He'd say, man, that was good luck. Man, that was good luck. And I said, no, Tom, that's the Lord. That's the Lord. That's, that's the Lord. We've been praying, Tom. It's the Lord. And that day he found out who the Lord Jesus Christ was. So thank you, Tom, for your help in that. And then I would be amiss if I didn't say today something about the co-pastor of our church. My wife. <laughs> she said, today, this is your day. I said, no, no, no. This isn't, this isn't my day. This is our day. I could not, I could not have stayed in this position and be used of the Lord if it hadn't been for my wife. Amen. You ladies know the importance that she's been to our church People that have worked in the nursery, people that have worked in Sunday school, people that have worked in the bus ministry, people that have been to our home and felt her hospitality, people that have been led to the Lord. Some of you are still here today that she led to the Lord 30 years ago. My wife is an incredible woman, and I love her very, very much. And she has been an incredible pastor's wife. And so I thank her today publicly for raising our children in the things of the Lord. I thank you for teaching them at home, which was very difficult. I thank you for standing by my side. I thank you for those times when you said, honey, I just don't know. Are you sure? Is it of the Lord? And challenge me. And I thank you for those times when you said, I see God moving and I'll follow. Thank you for that. I love you very much. I thank my children today. <sighs> for allowing me to pastor these 30 years. If they had ever said, we're not going to follow the things of Christ. We're going we're to live in this world. We're going to do the things of this world. I couldn't have pastored. I'd had to have resigned. I couldn't have led my own family. How could I lead the church? And so these years, they have, they have allowed me to do that. And then I want to thank my staff. Who have put up with some times when I wasn't the greatest guy to work with. It was only one day, but it was a rough one. <laughs> it was every Monday for 30 years. <laughs> Brother Hall and I can't say enough. 
I don't know. I don't have time and I don't have the words. You know my heart. Brother Levi, coming on as our youngest staff member, pastoral staff, working with our youth. What an incredible young man. God has some great things in store for him. His mom and dad are here today. You could be so proud, Dave and Diane. I know you are, but I, I don't think you know the extent yet of what God's doing with that young man. He's a fine young man. His dear wife. Jackie, thank you for working alongside of Pastor Holland and helping him through these years. And then Brother Yeomans, God bless you. What a fine young man. A number of years ago, I prayed and I said, Lord, it's time. I know it's time. It's getting close. I can see that your hand is upon and your hand is moving and we need somebody. And God sent him and his dear wife Beth along. What an encouragement it's been to see them grow and the things the Lord, his family is here today. You can be so proud of him as well. What a job he's doing and has done and going to do. I'm already excited. Some of the things that he's planning on doing in our church. I hope and pray that God does some incredible things here. He's already done so many. To be a part of it really is a, a huge honor. Huge honor. I came in this morning a little bit early. I said, Lord, I just, I really can't believe that you've allowed me to be a part of this. I went through those cards and letters the other day that I sent out last week, and that was only about a third of them. And I went through the rest this week and just sat at my desk and cried my eyes out to think of people that have been here, people that have stayed, some people that have gone, some people that have come back. We have some people back today that I'm just honored that you came. Thank you for making this the greatest 30 years of my life and the life of my wife and family. Thank you for that. Then I want to thank Darlene Veldheisen, who's been our church secretary for 20 years, and her husband, Brian. I remember the day that I went to Darlene, and I said, I'd love for you to consider the position of being our secretary. And her husband said, well, Pastor, we're excited about that, but we realize that if something happens in our church, Darlene would probably be the first to go, and we probably couldn't afford not to have her income. And I said, I'll promise you this. If you'll trust the Lord with me, he'll take care of us. And he did. And she's still there. And I want to say today, I appreciate each and every one of you for what you've done on behalf of this church, but most of all, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for a wonderful time. Thank you for these good folks. Thank you for a wonderful life. And I pray that you would continue that on and pass it on to this young family that will now take this church through new waters. Some will be deep, some will be fast, but all will be sweet if they simply trust you and follow your leading. May this church give to this young man the same loyalties and the same adherence that they have to this preacher. And Father, bless them for it, I pray. Thank you for this time today. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you please show your appreciation to our honored guests that are here today, those who have traveled to be with us today, those who have been mentioned as part of our staff, would you please today with me show your appreciation to each and every one of these today? Would you do that with me? The truth of the matter is today is that I have led our church, but these others have done the bulk of the work. I've come up with the ideas, the visions of the Lord, and they have fulfilled them. And so please continue to honor and follow them and work with them in the days ahead. I want to give you a very short message, and I know I've said that many times, but I mean it today. <laughs> Brother Yomas will speak as well. The message I've entitled, The Passing of the Mantle. So many phrases and meanings that we use today originate in the Bible. You may not even know this, but a little birdie told me is from the Bible. A fly in the ointment is from the Bible. An eye for an eye is from the Bible. The apple of my eye is from the Bible. And the passing of the mantle is from the Bible. You're about to witness one of those today. For today you will see the passing of the mantle. 
the prophet of Israel, still highly regarded in Israel today. The prophet of Israel was made aware by God that his mission as prophet was complete. Israel honors him so much today that in the Passover meal, there is a seat left at the table where no one sits that is reserved for Elijah if he should come. At the end of the meal, the doors open and the offering for Elijah to come is made so that he would come and sit at the table. For Elijah brings this promise. He will bring fathers and sons together. And he will bring the way for the coming of the Messiah, like John the Baptist did in the New Testament. In the last days, in that tribulation time, he will announce that the Messiah is going to come in a thousand year reign. We call the millennium. Highly honored. Elijah had been used mightily of God, and through him some great miracles were accomplished. And I think today, I would never think my, st my status that of Elijah, but I would think of that senior man today. I would think of that man who had walked first. And Elijah would be that man. And Elijah saw some great things accomplished. When I came here, we had 13 people our first Sunday. We met over in that building next door. We'll have some cake and some punch today and celebrate. And, and uh, God allowed us over some time to grow and to do some things. We paid off a $110,000 mortgage. And Pastor Holland tells me today that we have the money in the bank today that we could pay off our mortgage and get it down to $110,000 today if we needed to. So I leave here today with the same indebtedness that I had when I came. Let's just write that down for prosperity's sake. I hope you spend a lot of money, a lot of money Amen. for the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And have a good time paying it off. <laughs> the Lord will do it. The Lord did it here. We built this building. Incredible. Incredible feat for our church. We bought that property on Highbury. Amazing how that came about. I don't have the time to tell you all the miraculous things that brought that about to build that building out there and have it paid for when we got in to get it tax free. Be able to put a John and Romans in half of the homes of Canada in 14 years, and I'm praying we finish it off in less than seven. What an incredible feat for a church our size and a community this size to be able to do that. 6.5 John, million John and Romans at a cost of about 20, 25 cents a piece, 30 cents a piece, now up to 40 cents a piece. It's amazing what God has done. The people that we have seen and touched. We tried to figure one time how many people have been through our church. And we figure maybe 10,000 people from our community have been through here for events and services and all those different things. Maybe more. God moved upon the heart of Elijah that a young man by the name of Elisha would succeed him. And Elijah signifies that as he passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. I want you to look at 1 Kings chapter 19, verses 19 and 21. It says, So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him and with the twelfth. And Elijah passed by him and cast his mantle upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, Let me, I pray thee, kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow thee. And he said unto him, Go back again, for what have I done to thee? And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them, boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen, and gave unto the people, and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. I'm preaching today from the Bible that I preached from when I first came here. I have my name in it in the celebration of the 30th celebration of the Cleveland Baptist Church, 1958 to 1988. I came here in 1988. And I wrote in my Bible at that time, Robert Allen Stone, Cleveland Baptist Church, 4431 Tiedemar Road, Brooklyn, Ohio, 44144. And then written in there is Reverend Robert Allen Stone, 36 Park Avenue, St. Thomas, Ontario, Canada, pastor, Bible Baptist Church, and underscored it. I wrote in here, I'm a nobody that serves somebody telling everybody what he'll do for anybody. And I've meant that. I use this Bible many times. It's wore pretty good. It's got some notes in it. Not all great, but in the side leaf of this Bible, it's a wide margin Bible, so you can write notes. It says, Elisha, the man. Number one, he was a hard worker. Number two, he does not hesitate. And number three, he had great trust in God. This is my Elisha. And I believe those things speak true of this young man that will pastor this church. The question has to be, what's the significance of the mantle? 
Why did he cast his mantle upon him? The mantle was a cape from sheepskin. I have such a mantle. This is made of sheepskin, I believe. It's a blanket. It's my blanket. It's the blanket that I have at night when I sit in my recliner and I put over me. It is very comfortable. It's very soft. Uh, my wife got this for me. And uh, I've had this for a while. It's been a great comfort to me. And so the mantle was this type of covering. It should go this way, actually. The sheepskin out. Many prophets wore it. Many shepherds wore it. Many in the day of Israel wore it. It was a great comfort to them. You say, why would somebody want a sheepskin on them in the desert? Well, as the sheepskin keeps you warm in the winter, it keeps you cool in the summer. Reflects the heat. I was going to put that on, but I won't. It was used to ward off the heat of the day to catch any breeze that would blow, to shelter from wind, sand, and rain, to be used as a basket for carrying goods. It can be turned the other way and lapped up. We hear of Ruth when she was gathering in the fields and she carried an omer of wheat in her, in her cloak, in her mantle. And most importantly, as a covering to keep the cold of the night away. To fully understand the significance of the passing of the mantle, we must first see, the, see this, the message of the mantle. The message of the mantle. The message was this, Elijah's current mission was almost completed. And God's successor was chosen. Israel's care would continue on through another man, and Elijah knew it. Elijah was preparing for God's new purpose. The spokesman of God, we read in Revelation chapter 11, he'll come in the last days. He'll be put to death, and in three days he'll rise again. The significance of God's power upon him. And Elisha was preparing for his new position, training under the ministry of Elijah. About eight years ago, God began to speak to me about my mission of pastoring, and then it was almost completed. About five years ago, God spoke to my successor, and together we knew it would be his calling. John, today I want to take this mantle, and I want to cast it upon you. Put this on if you would, and there's a button there and a hook there. You can put that on. The casting of the mantle is significant. I want to show you the magnitude of the mantle. I found this fascinating. The mantle was often referred to, referred to as the outer garment. There were other clothes that were worn underneath, but that outer garment had great significance. It was because this outer garment was a man's covering by night that the law did not allow anybody taking this as a pledge or security, for this would deprive him of his means of keeping warm while sleeping. Such a garment, if taken at all, had to be returned by sunset. You could not take this garment from anyone. No matter who they were, no matter what they'd done, everybody had the right, had the privilege of being warm at night under the mantle. This was one of the greatest possessions a person could own. I would say today that one of the greatest possessions that God has allowed me to possess for these 30 years has been the care of the Bible Baptist Church. I don't think anybody could have ever taken that from me. If they did, they would have to fight tooth and nail. God has allowed me over these years to wear that mantle as, a, as an authority, as a leadership, as a position of God. And what a privilege it's been. But the time came when God said, that's over. I've got something new for you. I've got something I've created for you to do. And so there's Bearing Precious Seed Canada that I will gladly take and run with and hopefully see God do some incredible, incredible things as he's done already. The giving of that mantle to another had a huge significance. And by that we see the moment of the mantle. If you'll turn over just a couple of pages to 2 Kings chapter 2. Verse 5, it says, And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Knowest thou that the Lord will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. I'd like to think that he was saying, Guys, I know. I can't hardly bear it. Please don't mention it. 
And Elijah said, Elijah said unto him, Tarry, I pray thee here, for the Lord has sent me to Jordan. And he said, As the Lord liveth, as, the soul, as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of the prophets went and stood in view far off. And they too stood by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters. And they were divided hither and thither, so that they too went over on dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of the Spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, I shall be taken, or I shall so be unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass as they still went on and talked that behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it and he cried, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. He took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him. And went back, stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the water, waters, they departed hither and thither. And Elisha went over. John, I pray that God gives you a double portion of what he's given to me in this place. I pray, pray that this place is so packed out so soon that we will have to build a building out on Highbury Avenue. It's just so fortunate that we have a mayor that will allow us to do that. <laughs> That's not within his power, but we've already taken care of that long ago. I pray you see the people saved. I've seen saved. I see some friends here today. I read a letter just the other day that said, I just led my friend, Ivan Pope, into the Lord. Please pray for his wife. She's not saved yet. But she's saved now. Oh, I've got cards and letters of people. I got saved. I got to lead somebody to the Lord. I, I've got to do some things for the Lord. God's blessed us. Oh, so many things, John. I hope you see so many saved. I, say, I pray so many people in this community come to know a Bible Baptist church is a, that great and shining light, that, that safe haven, that hospital for those that are soul sick. Amen. I pray that you're able to build. I pray that you're able to, to fill the barns of God with great blessing. As Elijah leaves his office as the prophet, the preacher, the pastor, he gives to Elisha his mantle, letting him and all who see it know, I'll not need... I'll not need it anymore. I'll not need its pleasing. I'll not need its protection. I'll not need its privilege. I'll not need its presentment anymore. And today I tell you, as sad as I am to leave you as pastor, God has given me a mission that is so great and so exciting. I can't wait to be a part of it in a greater sense. He says to Elisha, I'm passing on to you all that God allowed me to be while I held the office of God's man, preaching God's word to God's people. God has a new mission for me and my sweet wife. We have so loved the 30 years that God has allowed us to minister to you in this office. God has allowed us to see miracles we could never have dreamed we'd be a part of. And as my final announcement to, your, to you as pastor, I want to tell you today with great excitement and with great privilege and honor that someone in our church is going to have a baby. Randy and Brittany Hughes are going to have a baby. Mike and Jackie Holland are going to have a baby. <laughs> Jackie doesn't know it yet. <laughs> Randy and Brittany are one of the sweetest couples you'll ever meet. And the Lord saw fit to give them a beautiful little girl for a very short time. Little Della. Della's with the Lord. Della's in safekeeping, waiting for mommy and daddy. And how our hearts broke when she left us. But how we rejoice that God's going to give her a little brother or sister. I can't wait to meet little Robert Allen Hughes. <laughs> awesome. 
or Roberta Alice, it doesn't matter. Ruth, we'll call her Ruth. My wife says, how come you always tell people to name kids after you but not me? Name her Ruth. I am so happy for you. Brother Hughes came to me and said, hey, I thought it'd be kind of neat on that service if we could, you know, maybe have you and Brother Yeomans announce. I said, oh, no. Oh, no. He'll get to be there for the birth. He'll get to be there for the dedication. He'll be there for those other things. I'm announcing this one, so I hope you don't mind. Good, because I did it already anyway. <laughs> but now it's time for me to pass the mantle. John, would you come and join me? I... I'm not going to let you keep the blanket. I need that. <laughs> it is warm. It is warm. I want to give you something greater. I want to give you my Bible. This served me very well. There's some tear stains in it. There's many times that I've hugged it and embraced it. Many times I've read through the notes and thought, what in the world were you thinking? <laughs> There's a few messages in there and I don't care if you ever preach for them, but I like you to have it. Just every now and then take a look at it and say, you know what? There was a man that came before me that loved me and saw in me what God saw in me. And so I want to give you my Bible Thank you. as I pass the mantle. Let's pray. <sighs> Father, thank you for this young man. Thank you for his family. Thank you for what he's already done and will do. God bless him. God help him. Help this church to rally around him and support him as they've done Ruthie and I and our family. And Father, may he one day stand and pass a mantle to another unless you would see fit to send your son. Then we would all be well pleased. Thank you for those who've come to share this day. In Jesus' name. Amen. In appreciation of the impact of a leader, many times a monument is erected to remember the influence and story of that leader. I was able to take a trip with Pastor Stone to Israel, and there were many monuments and statues there. And that was a great trip, and I want to thank you for that again. One I remember in particular was the statue of King David. And this was erected in the city of Jerusalem to commemorate who King David was. And so, Pastor Ruthie, I'd like you guys to join me on the platform, if you don't mind. And... Um, we would like to do something similar for you guys. So out front of BPS, we would like to erect a monument in honor of Pastor Stone and Ruthie and his contribution. Do we have that? There it is right there. Yeah. <laughs> the same one that's on Parliament Hill. <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> For those of you who think that's serious, I'm joking. That is, not, oh my. Uh, thank you. Um, we would like to commemorate you um, with something else. Um, if you were to describe Pastor and Ruthie, you would describe them as caring. You would describe them as compassionate. You would describe them as giving. You would describe them as hospitable. You would describe them as kind and you would describe them as loving. These people loved people, and they loved being around people. It was, uh, when we first started coming, you guys had us in your home all the time. We laughed a lot, and um, we, we saw you guys just continually do that. And um, they loved hosting people at their house, as some people mentioned in the videos. Um, they loved spending time laughing and carrying on. If you know anything about these two, they love to laugh, they love to carry on. And um, mostly at the expense of pastor. And um, I, your kids are brutal. Your kids are brutal. It, uh, many times they would um, be going over the Sunday morning message uh, with him and telling him how many things he did wrong. And it was funny. They made people really feel at home. And even in our church, you, you would notice that as soon as they, you walked in, if you were a visitor for the first time, they tried to make you feel at home. And that's who they are. It is for these reasons that our church would like to present you and build the stone fireplace in the foyer of our church, guys. So we did a little mock-up of it. This is kind of what it would look like. Um, you guys have just this kind of amalgamated everything. Uh, you guys are hospitable, caring, loving. And this is a place where you guys can, we can gather around and remember you guys by. And obviously stone and fire always go together because <laughs> pastor loves... <laughs> 
loves fire. <laughs> legally, that's all we can do. Legally, legally. So we want to give you guys that for in honor of your 30 years. And uh, would you guys join me in congratulating them for their 30 years? I prefer the statue myself. <laughs> Fireplace also has a mantle, which goes along with our theme here today. I want to continue preaching out of Second Kings chapter 2, and I get to be the young man. I get to be Elisha, and I don't take that responsibility lightly. It's exciting, but I'm scared as ever. And um, I'm, I'm excited to... Uh, be the pastor of this church, and I hope that uh, we'll have many great years. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 9, And it came to pass, when they were gone over, that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a dub double portion of thy spirit be upon me. And he said, Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from, from uh, thee, it shall, not be so, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so. And it came to pass, as they still went on and talked, that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire, and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven, and Elisha saw it. And he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more, and he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. The thing I like about this is that Elisha did ask for a double portion, and I, I'll be, I'm with you. I would love a double portion to see what God has done here. But Elijah asked for a double portion of Elijah's spirit. And I don't know if you can have a double portion of Pastor Stone's spirit or not. He's a very spirited fellow. And, uh, but it's exciting to know that Elijah asked for that. And I, I think it's amazing that Elijah had a spirit to teach people about Christ. You can see that in the video. You can see that in everything that we've talked about, about Pastor and Ruthie so far, is that they wanted to, people to know about Jesus Christ. That's their spirit. That's their heart. That's what drives them. And I, I want to ask for a double portion of that. Uh, and, and I believe Elisha was asking the same thing. He wanted the people of Israel to realize who God was. They wanted to know, he, Elijah wanted Israel to know who God was. And I want St. Thomas to know who God is. I want this church to know who God is. I want us to know Almighty God. The first thing that I want you to see this morning is that Elisha respected the foundation. He respected the foundation. I want you to look at 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 13. The Bible says this, And he took up also the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and went back and stood by the bank of Jordan. In verse 14, he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of Elijah? And when he also had smitten the waters, they parted hither and thither, and Elisha went over. So when Elijah and Elisha were together, they came across, and Elijah smote the waters with his mantle. And then as Elijah is taken away, his mantle falls from him, and Elisha picks that thing up and walks back over to the Jordan River and smites the water again and said, where is the Lord God of Elijah? You see, the thing I love about Elisha is he used what Elijah had. And I'm not going to stand here and say that anything Pastor did for the last 30 years was nothing because look around. This is the foundation that I now get to work from. What a blessing, what an honor, what a privilege. And Elisha had the mantle. Elisha got to take Elijah's mantle that he carried with him, that he did miracles with, that he changed people's lives with, that he lived with, that he served with, that he spent time with, just like you people. Just like the foundation that's in front of us. Just like so many things before us respect the foundation. That's what Elisha did. I love that. He used what Elijah had. It's important to respect the foundation that another man has laid. It would be absolutely terrible of me to never think anything of the foundation that's been laid over the last 30 years. It is also important not to make that foundation the only thing that is built. 
From this point on, unfortunately, we don't hear any more about Elijah's mantle in the story. So it wasn't as if Elisha just said, all right, smite the waters, okay, and then that's done. No, no. I believe Elisha kept that thing. And maybe he walked around with it, but you know what? He didn't use it as a crutch. What I'm trying to say is I'm not trying to disrespect the foundation. I'm trying to respect the foundation in that Pastor Stone and Ruthie did not work for 30 years for it to stop here. It will not stop here. And so though we need to respect the foundation, though we need to use what God has given us here in this place up until this time, we need to keep moving forward. And so Elisha didn't toss it aside and never remember it. I believe he kept it with him. But we see that he never used it in a miracle again. We don't read about it anywhere else from here on out. And so the second thing that I want you to see this morning is that we need to reinvest in the future. I want you to think about this quote. A good leader helps to identify and invest a person's gifts. A good leader helps to identify and invest a person's gifts. Let me give you three examples of that in Elisha's life. 2 Kings chapter 2, look at verse 19 with me. The Bible says this, And the men of the city said unto Elisha, Behold, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant, as my Lord seeth, but the water is not, and the ground barren. They have a problem. And he said, Bring me a new cruise, and put salt therein. And they brought it to him. And he went forth unto the spring of the waters, and cast the salt therein, in there, and said, Thus saith the Lord, I have healed these waters. There shall not be from thence any more death, or barren land. So the waters were healed unto this day according to the saying of Elisha, which he spake. This is the second miracle we see that Elisha does. But you, I want you to notice something. What did he ask for? A new cruise and salt. A new bottle and some salt. Pretty minuscule thing, pretty small thing, but it was something that every person in that city probably had. And you know what he did with that? He took it, and he used it, and God did a great miracle. And that water was good, and that water was now easy to drink, and that it would, could be used for the land, and the land would no longer be barren. They took something small, he identified it, and he invested it. You see, when you invest money into something, you hope that it will bloom and grow and become something bigger than you put in. At least that's the goal. Sometimes with our stock market, it doesn't happen that way. But when you invest that, you expect that it will grow. And that's exactly what happened here. They put salt in a new cruise and poured it in there and watched God do something great. Let me give you another example. Second Kings chapter 3, look at verse 9. Second Kings chapter 3, verse 9. The idea of this story is they're going to war. They need some help. They're out of water and different things. In verse 9, the Bible says, So the king of Israel went, and the king of Judah, and the king of Edom, and they fetched a compass of seven days' journey, and there was no water for the host and for the cattle that followed them. Seven days' journey they went out all the way around and could not find water anywhere. So they have a problem. And the king of Israel said, Alas, that the Lord hath called these three kings together to be, to be delivered them into the hand of Moab. They're going to fight against Moab. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not a prophet of the Lord that we may inquire of the Lord by him? And one of the kings of Israel's, king of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat, which poured water on the hands of Elijah. And Jehoshaphat said, The word of the Lord is with him. So the king of Israel and, the, and Jehoshaphat and the king of Edom went down to him. So they go see Elisha. And Elisha said unto the king of Israel, What have I had to do with thee? Get thee to the prophets of thy father and to the prophets of thy mother and the king of Israel unto him. Nay, for the Lord hath called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. And Elisha said, As the Lord of hosts liveth before whom I stand, surely were it not that I regard the presence of Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, I would not look toward thee nor see thee. But now bring me a minstrel, somebody to play music. And it came to pass when the minstrel played that the hand of the Lord came upon him, being Elisha. And he said, Thus saith the Lord, Make this valley full of ditches. 
For thus saith the Lord, ye shall not see wind, neither shall ye see rain. Yet that valley shall be filled with water, that ye may drink both ye and your cattle and your beasts. And this is but a light thing in the sight of the Lord. He will deliver the Moabites also into your hand, and ye shall smite every fenced city and every choice city, and shall fell every good tree, and stop all wells of water, and mar every good piece of land with stones. And it came to pass... In the morning when the meat offering was offered that, behold, there came water by the way of Edom, and the country was filled with water. And you can continue the story and see that they ended up defeating Moab. You know what they did? They simply dug ditches. What's the big deal? Go out, dig ditches. Dig as many as you want. It's not going to rain. There's not going to come a flood. But in the morning, those ditches are going to be full of water. Very simple thing. Not hard. Doesn't take a rocket scientist to build or dig ditches at all. All they had to do was use what they had in their hands were shovels, pickaxe. Who knows what they had? But they had enough to build or to dig those ditches. And we see God do a great miracle in a desert where there's no water anywhere around. I'm going to show you another one. Second Kings chapter 4, verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wise of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying... Thy servant, my husband, is dead, and thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord, and the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons to be bondmen. And Elisha said unto her, What shall I do for thee? Tell me, what hast thou in thy house? Pay attention to that statement. What hast thou in thy house? And she said, Thine handmaid hath not anything in the house save a pot of oil. Then he said, Go borrow thee vessels abroad of all thy neighbors, even empty vessels. Borrow not a few. And when thou art come in, thou shalt shut the door upon thee and upon thy sons and shalt pour out into all those vessels and thou shalt set aside that which is full. So she went from him and shut the door upon her and upon her sons who brought the vessels to her and she poured out. And it came to pass when the vessels were full that she said unto her son, bring me yet a vessel. And he said unto her, there is not a vessel more. And the oil stayed Verse 7, then she came and told the man of God, and he said, Go sell the oil and pay thy debt and live thou and thy children of the rest. All she had in her house was a pot of oil. And she used that and a bunch of other pots from somebody else's house and filled them all up, and she was able to pay everything that she owed and live off the rest. I mean, God is amazing God and a good leader, a good leader, all he does is find out those things that people have gifts of and just invest them into what God is going to do. And folks, that's all I want to be. I want you to take your gifts and I want you to invest them into the future of the Bible Baptist Church and what God can do. That's it. This is not a difficult thing, but it's going to take three things. You know what it's going to take? It's going to take sacrifice. All three of these stories show sacrifice. The first, not much sacrifice, salt and a new crew is probably not a huge sacrifice, but it sacrificed something. The second, sacrifice some sweat, digging some ditches, maybe some blisters on your hand. We're going to need some people that will sacrifice some sweat. And the third was oil, somewhat of a precious commodity to this lady who lost her husband, a widow, but she had it in her house. It may be the only thing that she had, but she sacrificed it. Folks, we're going to need people to sacrifice for this church. God needs people that will sacrifice for him. Romans chapter 12 and verse 1, I I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This is reasonable. God sacrificed himself for us. Is it not reasonable that we would sacrifice ourselves for him? Not only did they sacrifice, secondly, they had faith. I want you to go, and I want you to get me some salt and a new cruise. What is that going to do? Trust me. And God says, trust me. And God doesn't do things the way that we think he should do them. God uses minor things minuscule things and makes them great. And God does that here with a salt and a new cruise. And then he says, go dig ditches. Oh man, that's a lot of work. Man, I don't want to do that. Well, then you want to die of dehydration then because God's not going to send water unless you dig ditches. It took faith. And this lady had to give up her oil, sacrifice her oil with the faith that there would come more. It takes faith. 
Thirdly and finally, we get to enjoy the benefits. Every part of these stories, you look at them and you go, wow, look at the benefits that they get to enjoy. These people get to enjoy non-barren land and great water. These people get to enjoy water and and be re-energized and move forward now and conquer the land. And the lady gets to take and enjoy a life because she's now had her debts paid and she gets to live off the rest. Folks, if we will sacrifice and have faith in God, I can almost guarantee that we're going to enjoy life. I can almost guarantee it because God promises it. But it's going to take sacrifice and it's going to take faith. The Bible says in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that ye meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. The Bible Baptist Church should never exist because of one man or one family. It should exist because a group of people are willing to give God their gifts. This is not my church in the sense of I own it. This is my church in the sense of I belong to it. And I'm honored to be able to stand up here and belong to the same church that you folks do. But I'm just like one of you. I have gifts. I have abilities, and I'm standing before you today saying I'm giving them to God. And God's going to do what he wants to do with them. If this church is going to move forward, it is going to move forward because we all invest our gifts into it. Every person. It's a body. It's a body. If all were hearing, where were the smelling? And if all we're smelling, where we're the seeing? You see, we all have different gifts. We all have different things that we can do, but it takes all of us to invest them. If this church does not move forward, it is because we held out. We kept a little bit for ourselves. We didn't give all. My challenge to you today is this. What will you do to invest in the future? It is dependent upon you. It's dependent upon me. We have an obstacle before us. We have a problem. You see, we have a city that needs us. We have a country that needs us. We have a country and a city that needs our gifts. We have a church that needs our gifts. We have a church that needs talents. We have a church that needs abilities. But not only that, our need is we have a need of God that can take those talents and multiply them. I'm brought back to the story of a young lad with five loaves and two small fishes. That's all he had. You know what he did? He gave it. He gave it and watched God do something amazing. If God can take salt in a new cruise and a bunch of ditches and a pot of oil and use them to make miracles, what can God do with us? I'm excited. I'm so excited. I hope God will do something great because of just the... You're probably thinking, I don't have much. What do I have to offer? Just give it to God. We'll see what he can do with it. I'm going to ask you to have your heads bowed and your eyes closed. We trust you've enjoyed this message preached at the Bible Baptist Church of St. Thomas, Ontario, pastored by Dr. Al Stone. We invite you to be a part of our worship service this Sunday.